<clears throat> Welcome to the Lasting Love Connection video series and podcast. Here we are with the Gottmans. It's incredible to be here with both of you. Your work has touched me incredibly in my own life. It's very personal to me. Uh, in a period of nearly three years, I got to work with close to 200 couples that were impoverished with children, and I got to see the impact that that work made for parents, and really more specifically for the children. So again, I'm honored to be here. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's great it's to our meet you. Privilege. Oh, thank it's you. Our privilege. Mm-hmm. And we're so grateful to you for having done that work. Yeah. Because without you doing that work, there there are no ripples, right? Right. There's yeah. no effect out there. There's no yeah. impact. Yeah. So yeah, thank definitely. you. Do you want to start first question? Yeah, there? I hear that you're doing new work with technology and how it's affecting relationships, and I'd love to mm-hmm. hear more about that and what you find um, you're doing with that research and that work with technology and how it's putting the break between couples and connecting. Well, you know, it's not research that we've done really. It's really based on our clinical experience. And I, I think it's a double-edged sword. I, I don't think technology is either good or bad. It can work both ways. Sherry Turkle, in her book Alone Together, has shown that it can really damage relationships because people want less connection with more people rather than deeper connection with fewer people. So it can work that way, but I've also seen it work the other way. I've seen um, you know, our daughter, for example, you know, has all these Facebook friends and you know, this, the community she's able to create around herself is really impressive. And especially now that Robert Putnam has written this book, Bowling Alone, and we know that community is declining in America, this um, social networking can be really a, a great alternative to building community in America. So I think it can work. It can work in a ba- in a bad way, you know, where you know people you know don't want to talk on the phone. You know, they don't want to talk face to face. They'd rather text or you know use email, mostly texting. And we know that. That kind of communication really sucks for emotional communication. It's just terrible, you know. And so it can really hurt relationships, and it can get in the way of uh, communication. And people are always on their phone, you know, when they sit down at dinner. And we've seen twelve teenage girls sit at dinner, you know, at breakfast, not even talking to each other, just on their phones. <laughs> so it can be awful. And it can get in the way of a love relationship, too, but it can also be positive, I think. On the other hand, um, we are, um, we have been taking some of our exercises, for example. So the kinds of things that we do in workshops, we've created apps for Mm -hmm. them um, so that couples who may not be able to come to a workshop, who maybe can't afford it, can't travel, uh, maybe the partner doesn't really want to get involved, especially committed to two whole days, you know, of doing something with their partner, um, but are much more open to something that is very much part of their left hand, you know, which is the cell phone. So they can go forward and do some love map questions, for mm-hmm. example, where uh, some questions may come up that they're guessing the right answer in terms of their partner's world. So they get to turn getting to know one another and finding out more about the human being that their partner is through technology, through this app. Or, for example, um, there may be some open-ended questions, that is, questions that really open up the heart of the other person, open up the mind, really are questions that are much deeper. Like, why is it so important to you to be a parent, you know, in your future, something like that. So questions like that are part of another app that couples can play with, let's say on a date or when they're out to breakfast, asking one another, to again really get to know who are you? What are your deeper values? What are your deeper feelings? So we're, we're in the process of crafting lots of different apps um, because you know, we're, we're really old. You know, we tend to write on yellow notepads and stuff <laughs> instead of in our iPhones. But um, we know that technology is 
very interwoven into our culture now. And if we want to be able to really help and reach couples who are younger, who are very comfortable with technology, then that's the language we need to speak to in terms of helping people learn um, better ways to connect with one another and giving them the tools to do so. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, you know, in Afghanistan and Iraq, mm -hmm. uh, when soldiers are deployed for, you know, really long periods of time, sometimes 12, 15 months, um, what the Army has learned is that 58% of the time, what precedes a suicide attempt by a soldier is a fight with the stateside partner that they've had on Skype or, you know, a cell phone. And so a captain in the Army we worked with in Iraq created uh, Skype conversations between soldiers and their stateside partners where they work through our exercises <laughs> in our Seven wow. Principles awesome. book, wow. Seven Isn't Principles of Making Marriage Work, and it eliminated that problem of suicide, mm -hmm. you know. So we can use technology in a way that connects people in a very deep way. It doesn't have to be distancing, you know, mm -hmm. if it's used correctly. I love how you guys have taken that question and really framed it around a positive aspect mm -hmm. because there's so many people that take an issue like our schools aren't doing enough. And I consistently want to say, let's talk about what they're doing right and how we can enhance that and mm -hmm. utilize what is right, That's right in a mm -hmm. way to further enhance the experience of children and parents. Exactly. My next question for you is around that five to one ratio. So in the time that I've worked with couples, one of the key things that we come across a lot is couples who come from backgrounds where they've been heavily abused. Mm -hmm. And we know that if you've been heavily abused, you're likely to think that that's the way you receive or show love. And that five to one ratio, in a lot of ways, to some degree, at least for me, assumes that you have a lot of positivity and are able to draw that out and then feed that to your partner. Right, so how can we as individuals get more of that, that sense of being able to give love and be positive and use words of affirmation? Does, that, does my question make well, sense? Well, yeah, it does, and I, you know, I want to take a stab at it. Do you have something to say? I know you do, you know. But let me tell you, I want to tell yeah. you about a study that is really so interesting. It was done by these two researchers, Robinson and Price, and they put observers in couples' homes just to count positive things that a husband did toward a wife and a wife did toward the husband. And what was interesting about their study was they also trained the partners to count these positive things. So the husband was actually trying to notice positive things his wife did for him in an evening and she was doing the same for him, okay? Well, when the couples were, you know, happily married, the observers and the couple were in line, mm -hmm. you know, they were reliable. But when they were unhappily married, the couple missed 50% of the positivity that was there. Right. So a lot of the problem in this 5 to 1 ratio is not seeing the positive that actually is there mm -hmm. rather than having to generate the positive, right? right. So it's a, it's, a way of, it's a habit of mind of scanning your social environment for what's going right in the relationship. Mm -hmm. And if you've been abused, you're, you have these you know, shit detectors where you're trying to scan your social environment for potential danger right, you know, right. and what's wrong, you know, and so it requires a mental shift to look for what's going right and lo and behold, people are mostly doing a lot of really nice things for you, right. you know, yeah. regardless of your background. Hmm. So, you know, first of all, I think um, it's very easy uh, to oversimplify a little bit, you know, in terms of the effects of abuse on right. us. So, for example, um, I've been treating abuse for about 45 years now, something like that. That's where I started in my own individual therapy experience. So, um, what I've learned from all the people that I've treated is that actually people who um, have been abused are often very good at giving positives. <clears throat> Pardon me. They're um, they're using giving positives. Thanks, honey. I'll be okay. Um, giving positives as a way to 
uh, please the other person so the other person doesn't hurt them, mm. you see. So they develop giving positives as a survival skill, as a tool to be able to, uh, for lack of a better word, kind of shape the behavior of, of a partner so that that partner is kinder to them. Mm -hmm. That partner doesn't get displeased with them because if the partner does get displeased with them, they fear they'll get abused, mm -hmm. you see. Mm -hmm. So um, they're good at giving positives. So the thing that's very difficult for them is taking in the positives. Mm -hmm. um, so taking in the positives means saying, yes, I believe you, that's true. I am a good person. I am a kind person. I am a smart person. I am a pretty person, mm -hmm. whatever. That is hard because when you come out of abused homes, of course, um, as I've said earlier, our parents are a mirror for us. Right. So if they treat us badly, we believe we deserve it. If we deserve it, that means we're bad people. So taking in the positives means, wait a minute, I am a bad person, so why are you telling me I'm a good person? It doesn't make any sense, you see. It, it collides right. with our own messages you know, that we've internalized. And so in order to take them in without you know, batting them back and saying something offensive like, you're just saying that because you want to go to bed with me tonight, you know, mm -hmm. something like that. Um, we have to make a conscious, mindful, concerted effort to crack ourselves open, open up the door, and say, this makes no sense to me, but I'm going to take it in. I'm just going to take it on faith and, you know, be thankful that my partner doesn't have great eyesight, has to wear glasses, thinks I'm beautiful, terrific, <laughs> great news. So just take it in. And that's where the hard work comes in. Right. Does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And it's it's a complete mind, it's, it's rewiring your brain essentially right. to believe something that you were taught wasn't true or something exactly. that you were told the opposite. So now there's an effect of this is incongruent with the messages and the way that my mind has been trained to think. Uh, you know, sharing our, about our relationship, one of the things that early on when we went to Harville Hendricks's seminar, uh, we did this exercise, it was an appreciation exercise where Kamala got to stand up and walk a circle around me and give me compliments for a minute. And during like, that time, ecstatically yeah, just you know, <laughs> rapid fire compliments. And I got uncomfortable. And I told her afterwards, I, I felt uncomfortable with that experience. Whereas mo a lot of the room was like, this is awesome. You know? <laughs> and I felt uncomfortable. Yeah. And that really resonates with, you know, what you're saying resonates for me in that uh, receiving compliments to some degree is uncomfortable for me. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So, I'm yeah. really curious about more about the piece about people who have had trauma in their childhood. I mean, most people have, it seems. Mm -hmm. So I'm really curious, what do you say to people when they're trying to feel more safe in their relationship? And what are some tools that you give them to feel that sense of safety? Well, I think, you know, there's some very particular tools uh, to use for people who've been traumatized in order to increase their safety. So one, for example, is never, when you've been traumatized, never assume uh, the, the thought you think your partner is having is accurate. Mm. Don't assume <laughs> it. Ask it. Mm. Ask it. So, for example, you know, if one of you has been traumatized and the other one says something like, um, gosh, I don't think the bills have been paid, have they? What you end up hearing the other person say and what you're thinking the other person saying is, oh, so you think I'm really lazy, you think I'm bad, you think I'm, you know, irresponsible, that I haven't paid the bills? So, you ask, 
are you saying that <laughs> you're upset with me that I haven't paid the bills? Is that what you're saying? And the other person then gets a chance to correct your distorted perception and to say, no, gosh, this wasn't about you at all. I was just thinking to myself, uh-oh, they haven't been paid, and either you or me, maybe we should sit down together and pay them. I mean, you know, it wasn't about you. So, you know, a lot of times when we've been traumatized, any little hint, we're vigilant, we're hyper-vigilant for criticism. Mm -hmm. And we're going to see it where it doesn't exist. And then we'll react defensively, which then psh, ends up with a, you know, escalated quarrel. So instead of assuming we know what our partner's thinking or saying, ask. You know, that's one tool. Check it out to make sure that you're not distorting the perception. Another thing to do is ask for reassurance. So if your partner hasn't said, I love you um, all day today, what may come up in you is anxiety of, oh gosh, I wonder if they still do. I wonder if they still care about me. I wonder if, you know, their lunch with that cute girl at work means maybe they're attracted to the other girl. You know, that's where our minds will go, right? When, right. We're, when we don't feel safe, when we're so insecure. So, again, asking the partner for what you need is huge. Coming to the partner at the end of the day, how was your day? Honey, I really miss you saying you love me. Would you please tell me you love me? And then give me a detailed list of why <laughs> so I can figure it out. So asking for what you need is one of the hardest things in the whole wide world to do when you've been traumatized because, of course, you're not worthy of anything, right? And it's not safe. Yeah. And, and, it's you feel, not safe. and you feel like it's not right? <clears throat> yeah. So I feel safety in all relationships, trauma or no trauma, is attunement, which means that, you know, you really do listen when your partner is upset, even upset with you, you know, that you deal with your partner's negative emotions by saying, talk to me, baby. I want to know what, mm -hmm. what you feel. Oh, you're mad at me? Okay, so, you know, what are your concerns? Tell me, you know, what are they? I'm taking notes. You know, what is it? And by always meeting, you know, negative emotion, anger, disappointment, hurt feelings, sadness, fear, you know, not feeling safe, feeling afraid, by comfort and listening and taking it in and empathy, then you build safety, systematically build safety, moment by moment. Mm -hmm. I was working with this couple and the husband has autism. Mm -hmm. So his uh, sensitivity to emotion is not really there. He doesn't really get the subtle nuances of emotion. So his wife said, you know, it's really hard with my husband because I have to be very clear with him about what I'm feeling. Uh, unlike if I'm conversing with you, this is what she said to me, when I converse with you, you get the little subtle things and what that means. That's right. My husband is completely inept in that field. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. I actually thought that was awesome. I said, I really wish you could come and teach a class on how to be that clear in your relationship so that we assume that if I do this or that, you are going to get it because you are sensitively attuned. And hopefully you are to some degree, but to another degree, there's a, there's a space of responsibility of how clear can I communicate so my partner is let into my world, right? Right. I want to ask you another question is, we, during the classes at Loving Families, Loving Children, we taught gentle startup. Mm -hmm. which is, uh, you know, for anybody who's tuning in and doesn't know that skill, is essentially I feel when and I need. So when any situation comes up, we talk about the feeling that that situation brings up for us, then the situation that creates that emotion and the need behind it. Now, a lot of the confusion that occurred when teaching that skill is people thought they always had to be very sweet while they did it because it's gentle. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, in your work, I understand that you're not always advocating that we're going to be super sweet when we do these gentle startups. Can you say a little bit more about that? Mm. Um, sure. You know, I think 
I'm going to kind of take a leap here that when you say sweet, you mean not angry. Right, not right? upset, or they would go, hey, honey, you know, even yeah. though they're upset. I yeah. feel so, angry, but I don't worry about it. <laughs> I feel but really I yeah. love you. And, uh, so there's a sense of a little bit of... What's your favorite food? Yeah. And I'll feed yeah. you if you I'll would. feed you, and we'll have sex later. <laughs> exactly. Fun. And then there was the other thing that would happen, too, is I did the general startup, but then he doesn't do what I asked him to do. <laughs> right. <laughs> say, well, it's not Fuck the goal. you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Right, right, <laughs> right. So, you know, being sweet, um, most of us are not sweet all the time. Right. Um, and if we are, it's phony. So, uh, whatever sweet means, I mean, I think, you know, the point is that um, gentle startup is meant as an antidote or an alternative to being critical or contemptuous. Right. So let's put it in context, first of all. So um, one doesn't have to necessarily be sweet, per se. One just has to not be critical or contemptuous. And the way to do that is uh, to be describing yourself. I feel about mm -hmm. what. Here's what I need. Um, so if you mean by sweet, don't be critical. Yep, that's true. But sweet like saccharin sugar, like <laughs> bleh, you know, it's like I want to go take a bath or something. So um, you can have negative emotions. You can express those negative emotions. Right. I'm pissed. I'm angry. I'm furious. I'm really upset. You can have passion. You can have intensity in your expressing your complaint. That's quote unquote gentle startup. But the point is to not go critical and contemptuous and say, you know, you, 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 you are too lazy. You are irresponsible. You, etc. That's the harsh startup that we're trying to avoid. So as long as you describe yourself in making the complaint and the situation, good enough. That's good enough. But sweet doesn't hurt. I, I like sweet. <laughs> I'll taste sweet. Pastry is good. Sweet. Yeah, right. Pastry That's right. And say, yeah. Maybe this is what I'm upset about. Eat this pastry, and we'll talk about why I'm angry with you <laughs> yes. as you're enjoying it. That, that, That's that exactly nice. right. Yeah. The other thing that you're bringing up, um, which is such a good point, is that asking nicely doesn't guarantee you you'll hear yes mm. yeah. in response. Mm. Your partner still has the right to say no, to be true to themselves and say, gee, you said that ever so sweetly, but forget about it, it's not gonna happen. So that's okay. Your partner has a right to adhere to their own needs, their own values, to what feels right for them. And if that means no in response to your need, then they'll say sweetly no. Mm. Right. And, and you move on. Yeah. I'd like to hear the other side of that about the listener. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you what do you think the listener should be doing at that time, or what's the best way to hear someone? Mm. Uh, depends on what you're talking about. So if it's a topic where your partner's need is your nightmare, you know, let's say for example, you just had a baby by cesarean section and it's a week later and your partner wants to have sex, okay? You're not excited about having sex at that point. So how do you listen without going ballistic and saying, are you kidding? I just went through, what's the matter with you that you're asking? So you don't want to go defensive, that's the point. So one of the things you can do, this is really helpful, we have clients do this when they've had huge escalated quarrels, take notes. Mm. Take notes while you're listening. And then, if your partner's done gentle startup, it will be easier to say, okay, let me make sure I've got it straight. And say what you heard, you know, give a little summary of what you heard your partner saying. Um, and try and put yourself in your partner's shoes. 
mm. to say, okay, makes sense that you want that, still doesn't mean you have to say yes. But what it does mean is at least you can help your partner feel listened to, feel understood. And you may, as a listener, also want to ask some questions before you respond, like, what makes that so important to you? Or what would be your ideal dream here? Or is there some childhood history or backstory to why you want this? And that will enable you to understand at a much deeper level what your partner's asking for and why they're asking for it, which may soften your desire to want to reach towards <coughs> your partner and give them what they're asking for. Right. I want to say something about no. <laughs> All right. So, uh, so we have, I, you know, I have a, using game theory, I have a mathematical proof that if people respond to no when, you know, somebody asks a, for sexual intercourse or making love, with punishment, any negativity, mm -hmm. then that couple will eventually stop having sex. The only way to respond to no about sex is to say, oh, well, thank you for telling me you're not in the mood to have sex. What would you like to do? You know, mm. Want to go for a walk? Want to make popcorn and watch a movie or, you know. Eat pastry. Yeah, eat pastry, you know. <laughs> what would you like to do? So you, Are you guys hungry? respond to no. <laughs> Always, hungry sweet. Sweet. Always hungry for pastry. Always hungry for pastry. We can't have it on our diet. Oh, I love that. Fantasize that, about it. I think you're. <laughs> I, think that, I think that piece is really important uh, yeah. to, to hear that when someone is saying no, that you don't respond negatively. Yeah. And that you think that, or you found that that's really essential. And so, what if you're feeling hurt though? Someone just said no to you, and you feel rejected or hurt. What, mm -hmm. what would you say? I, that? You know, I think you just you know eat it. <laughs> mm. You know, and I you, disagree. Okay, I think you do. I think that particularly if, if a man feels hurt, you know, now if he's getting rejected every time, that's yeah. a different. Then it's worthy of conversation. Mm. You know, let's talk about this. What's going on for you? What's happening? But um, you know, I think that you know when somebody says no to sex, you really want to say, you know, I'm happy to know you're not in the mood. You know, but it doesn't mm. end connection. What are you in the mood for? You know, what can we do together? <laughs> she disagrees. Yeah, let's, let's okay. hear what the other side yeah. <laughs> So, you know, again, it comes back to asking. So, you know, for all of us who come into relationship, having had less than perfect parenting, if, if you know, we want to have sex with our partners and our partner says no, we end up feeling hurt. But then, all right, so what are we hurt by? We think that our partner doesn't love us, our partner's not attracted to us, our partner doesn't feel any sexual desire for us, you know, can go so far as our partner wants somebody else, you know. And so, again, it comes down to asking. Mm -hmm. It comes down to saying, uh, does that mean you're not attracted to me? Does that mean you don't love me? Does that mean, et cetera? Mm -hmm. You know, this, this brings to mind a story. This is, oh God, it's such a, such a sad story in some ways. We have a, uh, a very, very wonderful therapist and friend who is currently dying of a brain tumor. Mm -hmm. He may be gone by now. Uh, it's days. And we went to visit him about a week and a half ago, and um, we spent some time with his wife. And here is this man, he's like 63, he's on literally on his deathbed. Just the sweetest, most wonderful man, I mean, just loving, fabulous man. And he and his wife are sitting outside, she tells us, and he says to her, you know, honey, do you think I've been too selfish and self-centered throughout my life? Are you sorry you married me? Are you sorry you married mm -hmm. me? That's what, yes. mm -hmm. And 
she says, oh my God, no, and she breaks down in tears. And mm -hmm. she tells him how loving he's always been, you know, in their 35 years together, and how grateful she is for everything. So... And the arguments were not getting enough of him. That's right. That's what the arguments were about, you know. And so, you know, there you have even, you know, wonderful, fabulous human beings who've been together forever and they're committed and they love each other and they've raised kids together. Even there, on a deathbed, there's the question of, do you, was I Did good I give enough? you enough? Yeah. Did I give yeah. you enough? And have I been good enough for you to love me, mm. to be worthy of your love? Mm. So it's a question we always have. So when we feel hurt, you know, Kamala, coming back to your question, when we feel hurt by somebody saying no to us, what do we do with it? Ask. Mm. Because that hurt has these preconceived notions beneath it that say, I'm not worthy of love. So ask, am I? And that's typically what you'll hear. No, well, I love that we got two perspectives on that. You know, that's really. <laughs> we always have two, two totally different. Perspectives. Even though we together make one brain, <laughs> <laughs> two halves, one cerebral cortex. Two half wits make a wit. <laughs> <laughs> one whole wit. So, so I wanted to finish off with this one question because we were talking about attunement and how important it is. And working with couples, one of the hardest things about being with a couple in the midst of an argument is teaching them how to slow down and, as you said, write down what you hear, mm -hmm. right? So if you're listening right now, uh, all you technologically savvy people, you can write down on your iPhone or you can use your notepad during an argument and use that as a way to kind of calm and simmer down the argument. But teaching couples that skill of attunement is one of the most difficult or takes a while to really help them learn that. Yet what I found is that a lot of times couples want the solution and the solution a lot of times is missing the whole point of the drive, right? And if we think of love mapping as a drive through a city and creating a GPS system so we know how to drive around tactfully and not end up in the wrong roads, an argument is a really wonderful opportunity to update that map. Mm -hmm. But couples struggle with that. Mm -hmm. Yet what I found is that if, if couples can slow down and set, okay, so you're asking for sex and uh, you don't want it, or you know somebody doesn't want it, so it's a charged conversation. Mm -hmm. One person automatically feels hurt and then one person maybe tries to explain what's going on and then you start getting into the defensiveness, the criticism, and slowing down that whole process is very hard to teach couples how to stop that. Yet well, the discovery, at least for me, has been if they can, what happens is that they don't actually need to come to the place of resolving the problem, they come to a place of understanding it. And so then next time the partner asks for sex and one doesn't feel like it, one go, I know you're tired actually, maybe, maybe tomorrow we can schedule it. Or, it turns into understanding. Right. What have been some skills that you've discovered that can help you when your partner is charged and you're feeling charged and one of you has to set some of your emotions aside to listen and be the receiver and the listener? Well, when you say charged, um, there's various degrees of charge. Right, that's true, <laughs> yeah. So, um, of course, you know, in John's research with Bob, one of the big things that they found that was a predictor of, you know, very poor prognosis in the future for a marriage or a relationship was getting flooded, meaning heart rate above 100 beats a minute, right. or if you're athletic, maybe 80, 85 beats a minute, while you're sitting there having a conversation. You've gone into fight or flight. so. If the conversation is very touchy and sensitive, you can get flooded, you can feel attacked, you can feel criticized, and your body will react to that as if you know somebody's throwing a spear at you. So you go into fight or flight, and you can't think well when you're in fight or flight. You can't resolve anything. You can't even hear what's being said, because all you hear is attack. So one tool that we often give people is if either one of you feels so charged 
that you are really <clears throat> feeling hot or your body is really getting tense, your fists are clenching, your jaw is clenching, your eyes are bugging out, you know, whatever. Your heart rate is too high. And can I add a little piece because sure. if you're a listener or you're viewing, I want to illustrate how simple that is. So when I taught the classes and we taught this thing about getting flooded and mm -hmm. then you get into stonewalling and etc. One of the things that I did is I had couples stand up and run in place. Oh. And then I tried to have a conversation with somebody. And I would just ask them simple questions. How was your day? What did you eat for breakfast? And it was hard for people to have a conversation. Then I'd have them sit down and I'd say, put your hand on your heart, here on your wrist, and tell me what that feels like. And everybody would say, it's charged. And I'd say, that can happen very simply when you're having a conversation around a subject yeah. like money, kids, sex, finances, etc. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. So it's movies. very simple to feel <coughs> that way. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful. Yeah, that's right. Um, so people have to tell their partners that they need to take a break and uh, to tell their partner when they will come back to resume the conversation. They need to take a break where they're out of visual range, out of hearing range of each other. Um, and during that time they're working on self-soothing. Mm. But when they announce they want a break, if they don't tell the partner when they're going to come back, the partner will just feel abandoned and cut off. So that's an important element of it. When they're on their break, they need to not be thinking about the argument because that will keep them engaged in all the feelings of it, which will keep them flooded. So instead, they need to do something self-soothing to take their mind off the argument so their bodies can calm down. For example, listening to music, taking a walk, reading a book, yoga, meditation, you know, anything that will be self-soothing. Then they can come back and it will be a very different conversation because their bodies are calm. Another thing with, with feeling charged is to make a little repair right in the moment when you start feeling charged. And a repair can be something like can you hold on a minute? Let me just catch my breath for a second. Mm -hmm. Or could be something like, um, will you please stop interrupting me? I'm just needing to finish my thought. Or, gee, you know, that felt like an insult. Could you say that in another way? The other partner, in order for it to really be a repair, needs to take that in to hear it and to say, okay, all right, go ahead, finish. Or, sorry, I didn't mean to insult you. Let me say it in another way. <clears throat> then, it, then a repair is made and it calms things down. We have, at our institute, we have what's called a repair checklist. And it has a whole series of phrases for people to look at and repeat when they can feel that conversation getting too charged and crossing mm -hmm. over the line ugly territory. Um, if they look at that list, there's lots of phrases that are repairs <clears throat> that they can then just say in the moment, even though it feels kind of phony because it's not their words. Nonetheless, it has the effect of slowing things down and getting things back on track. The other thing that, <clears throat> that we do in therapy is try to teach people uh, concept that Dan Weil has come up with that is solving the moment instead of solving the problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what does solving the moment mean? It's really about turning attack and defensiveness into self-disclosure. So instead of attacking, instead of getting defensive, you really talk about what you're feeling. And as therapists, we can help clients do that and speak for them and when we do that, we can really model, you know, how to, how to, you know, say, I'm feeling defensive instead of, you know, attacking or right. <laughs> becoming right. defensive, you know, or acting like an innocent victim and becoming defensive. And you can really say, well, I'm feeling defensive right now, like Julie said, the repair. Can you say that in a different way? Uh, so it's totally different to say, yeah, I'm feeling defensive. Can you say that in a different way than say, well, you're an idiot. <laughs> you know, or right. you're an idiot too. <laughs> right. You know, uh, 
So solving the moment is really, I think, a really useful concept for couples to learn. You know? So they're not only trying to solve the problem, they're trying to solve the moment right. when they run into a speed bump yeah. you know, in their communication. I like that, and I want to add that that's like, for me anyways, one of the common questions I get asked during interviews is, when does a couple know that they should go in for counseling therapy? Or, you know, is it, is it a good idea to get coaching around your relationship? And one of the examples I use is Tiger Woods at one point had 20 different coaches. You know, so we don't just get coaching when we're thirsty and now we need to have that thing. It can be a really great idea to get it early on. And I just wanted to highlight your answer to that question really brought forth how coaching can help us because someone can help role model and guide us through mm -hmm. that process of how to do that. Would you like to have any finishing thoughts? I'm or? just curious if there's anything else that you want to make sure that people know about before we close out today. No, I, it, many thoughts are coming to mind, but they're not appropriate to say. <laughs> so <Football>. democratic. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. Um, so it's been a pleasure. Yeah, it's been. Fun. I would say. Uh, there's one little tool that we have at the Gottman Institute co called How to Be a Great Listener. Mm -hmm. And it's just a little pamphlet on how to listen to anger, how to listen to fear, how to listen to sadness, and how to you know, be a real active listener who listens uh, you know, with love in mind and compassion in mind. I think that's a skill we could all develop a lot better. Thank you so much for being on the Lasting Love Connection podcast, yeah. and we're just so grateful to have your wisdom and your insights Thank and you. how to live more harmoniously in our relationships and be real with each other, too. Right.